Hi, and welcome to uh, module three and lecture five covering the indefinite integral and the antiderivative. In the previous module, we covered the definite integral, which was the area under curve between two points. If you recall, we wrote that like this. Here, this curly S means integral. It's an analog to a sum. The A and the B are the bounds. They tell you where to start integrating, where to start summing the area, and where to stop summing the area. A is the beginning, B is the end. F of x here is the integrand. It's what the function you're integrating. It's the function who's the area under which you care about. And this dx is the infinitesimal and tells you which variable you're integrating over. Now that's great and all, but we have to do nothing in terms of how to actually compute that thing. To figure it out, we're going to have to find a way to compute integrals, which is going to require us to compare integrals to derivatives. Now they compare, as you mentioned in the very first module, because the two of them are opposites in many cases. They're inverse operations. Much like if you add 5 and subtract 5, right, or divide by 5 and multiply by 5, get back the same thing. If you integrate and differentiate, you end up with the function back again. Let's see how that works. First, let's define something. Let's define f, capital F, as the antiderivative, write that, of little f. It's the opposite. It's the opposite in a very particular way. If you differentiate the antiderivative, the two operations effectively cancel out, leaving the function back again. So before we see how it's useful, how do we work with that? Well, we kind of guess at this point in time. So let's say we wanted to have f b1. So it's a constant, the easiest constant you can get. What's one's antiderivative? Well, it's the function such that if you differentiate it, you get one. What's that? We can think back to last lecture. And remember that your power rule, somewhere up here, is that for any x to the n, the derivative was n times x to the n plus, minus 1. So what do we, how do we do with that? Well, if n is 1, right, then if I um, have 1, right, then if I differentiate x to the 1, I get 1, right, because this is 1, n minus 1 equals 0, x to 0 is 1, so the derivative of x is going to be 1. So one possibility for capital F, for the nth derivative, is x. So we can write that here. Now why did I say one possibility? Well, what about x plus 10? Well, remember the derivative of a constant is zero by that same power rule. So the derivative of x plus 10 is one plus zero because the derivative is linear. So it has the same exact derivative. So x plus 10 would work as well as would x minus 100 or x plus a million or whatever. So in general, the entire class of functions x plus some constant c can catch capital C there, are going to be possible antiderivatives for the function 1. This constant C is called the constant of integration, as we'll see in a second. So there's a class of functions that work as antiderivatives. But here, we found one that's the opposite of x, of, of 1. Now we can try it again. What about x squared? Oh, sorry, it's sorry, sorry, x. <laughs> Gave it that away a little bit. What produces x when you differentiate? We know from the power, the power rule, x squared becomes x. But you pull down a 2. So if you divide by 2 ahead of time, that cancels. So let's give that a shot. Don't forget your c. If I differentiate that, I pull a 2 down. 2 times 1 half is 1. So I just get x. 
right? Because 2 minus 1 is 1, x to the 1 is x. So I get x, and that's the nth derivative of x. I could keep doing that for various different, different examples, and we'll get to the more general rules for that later. We can give more examples like that, but it's probably best to wait until after we have fewer modules pass and we have more technology to calculate them ourselves rather than just keep guessing things. Um, so we'll finish this module with the connection between the antiderivative and the indefinite integral. Turns out they're the same thing. The connection is really easy to make. You can see that. So here is the antiderivative, capital F. Here is the indefinite integral which looks the exact same as the definite integral, except no bounds. So rather than having a definite region um, over which you're calculating the area of a function, it's indefinite, it's unspecified. This indefinite integral produces a function, the antiderivative, the same thing. Um, you take the, the, the function here, that's the integrand, you integrate it using methods that we'll learn in a few modules, and that produces the antiderivative, which has a nice property that if you differentiate it, you get back the original function. So if I were to differentiate the integral, I would get back the original function again. So again, it's nice and clear, and that's it. The antiderivative is the, in many ways the inverse operation to the derivative. And it's the exact same thing as the indefinite integral. In the next module, we'll discuss how to connect the indefinite integral to the definite integral, thereby allowing us to calculate a definite integral, the area under the curve, as long as we can compute an indefinite integral, which is the exact same thing as computing an antiderivative, which just requires us to figure out how to reverse the process of differentiation to produce an integral. An antiderivative. And that will turn out to be not so bad in some cases and a little messier in other cases, but we'll go through it and we'll see that all the rules that we're going to learn come directly from the rules of differentiation, just in a sense reversed. That's it. Um, thank you very much.